Good morning. This is the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of Oversight and Government Reform. I am Congressman Dennis Kucinich, Chairman of the Committee. The subject of today's committee hearing is entitled Peeling Back the Tarp, Exposing Treasury's Failure to Monitor the Ways Financial Institutions Are Using Taxpayer Funds Provided Under the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Our first witness today will be Mr. Neil Kashkari, the Acting Interim Assistant Secretary for Financial Stabilization, the Department of Treasury. Uh, we are joined today by a number of members uh, of Congress, and uh, including uh, the new ranking member, uh, Mr. Jim Jordan of Ohio. And I want to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Jordan to uh, this uh, position on the subcommittee. And I want to let you know, uh, sir, that I'm looking forward to uh, working with you. It's very interesting in this subcommittee we have uh, uh, an Ohio connection, not only Mr. Jordan, but Mr. Issa is originally from Ohio. Uh, Mr. Turner's from Ohio. Ohio's well represented in this. Uh, our witness is from Ohio. And, and our witness is from Ohio. So I, I suppose uh, this is Buckeye Day on Capitol Hill. Um, we're going to. Um, we're going to begin with uh, an opening statement. I want to thank Mr. Cummings uh, uh, for being here, as, as well as uh, the, the gentleman from Vermont, uh, Mr. Welch, and uh, the witness with unanimous consent, uh, the uh, witness, Mr. Kashkari, uh, when we get to his testimony, is going to be given 10 minutes. Uh, he may not need it all. But given uh, the gravity of this subject, he's going to be given uh, 10 minutes to uh, make his opening statement uh, without objection. The Troubled Assets Relief Program has provided about $200 billion in capital injections to hundreds of banks. The money was provided with virtually no strings attached. Most of the banks didn't even bother to account separately for the federal monies. It's debatable whether the efforts of those that did amount to anything meaningful. Treasury does not even ask TARP recipients for a detailed accounting of their use of TARP funds. Because some of the banks are multinational banks, the kinds of transactions they are doing include billions in loans and investments in other countries at precisely the time that a liquidity shortage has impaired credit markets in the U.S. and a recession deeper than anything seen since the Great Depression is impairing production and employment. Nevertheless, several very large transactions conducted after these banks received billions in a taxpayer-funded bailout include an $8 billion of financing arranged by Citigroup for public authorities in Dubai, a $7 billion investment by Bank of America in the China Construction Company, a $1 billion investment by a J.P. Morgan subsidiary in expanding operations in India. Unfortunately, the legislation Congress passed creating the TARP required very little of the recipients to receive taxpayer-funded subsidies. The Treasury regulations and contracts crafted to implement the TARP did not require much of anything other than someone signed for the money. It may be argued that transactions such as these are beneficial to the balance sheets of the banks that are making them, that they have some indirect benefit to the U.S. financial system as a whole. Really. If the banking system is in serious enough trouble to require massive amounts of federal support, shouldn't that federal support be directed and channeled to the domestic economy? Or are these examples of large investments and loans to foreign entities among the kind of transactions the American taxpayers should be supporting with TARP monies when we face significant credit problems here at home? How does a multi-billion dollar financing deal to Dubai ease the liquidity crisis in the United States of America? What about other kinds of uses of funds, corporate spending on lavish parties, the continuation of contractual agreements to pay for naming rights on professional sports stadiums, corporate sporting event sponsor sponsorships. Is this 
what the taxpayers expect our government to do with TARP funds. Is this what Congress intended? If it was the business judgment of the very same bankers in charge that governed their decisions before the financial crisis and arguably helped create the crisis, is it tolerable to continue to defer to that judgment and allow them to spend taxpayers' money with no explanation, little accountability, and no questions asked? Under the precedent set by former Secretary Paulson, the Paulson TARP program makes no demand on TARP recipients for detailed information about their spending. Even though the statute obligates Treasury to be able to prevent waste and abuse of TARP monies, Mr. Paulson's Treasury Department did not even bother to set standards for waste and abuse of TARP funds. Trust them is essentially what seems to pass for oversight of the capital purchase plan. Treasury has no concrete idea of how TARP monies are being used. They don't ask questions of TARP recipients about their use of funds and don't gather sufficiently detailed information from TARP recipients to know what to ask about. The problem is not a lack of authority. Under the agreements between Treasury and the TARP recipient financial institutions, Treasury has broad contractual authority to scour company books in search of, among other things, waste and abuse by TARP recipients. But in practice, Treasury is not doing so. The serious shortcomings in the creation and implementation of the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, namely the absence of definitions of waste and abuse or explicit conditions for the use of TARP funds resulted in the inescapable conclusion that Treasury's oversight will not find waste, fraud, or abuse because it isn't looking for it. Now, to read Mr. Kashgari's testimony today, we find nothing to contradict that conclusion, with all due respect. In fact, Mr. Kashgari was asked to testify on the steps that Treasury has taken to detect and prevent the waste of TARP monies. Mr. Kashgari's testimony does not address that question. Rather, he describes Treasury's efforts to do something else, to determine the impact of TARP monies on the bank's lending activity. Treasury has submitted 90 pages, 90 pages of uh, intermediation snapshots from the largest 20 TARP recipients. But what does that prove? Perhaps very little. There are significant shortcomings to Treasury's reliance on the monthly intermediation snapshots. First, only the 20 largest TARP recipients report anything at all. Obviously, there can be little monitoring of the impact of TARP monies on the credit activities of the 297 TARP recipients, which do not file monthly intermediation snapshots. Second, the snapshots do not provide details about any individual transaction, no matter how significant. Third, these snapshots address the lending side, the lending side of the recipient's business. They do not address any other investment or expenditure. And fourth, and importantly, they address only new lending and not the contraction of existing lending in the form of foreclosures and elimination of credit lines. If the amount of new lending does not more than make up for the amount of lending contracted and that's through foreclosures, decreasing credit limits, calling back loans, then the net amount of credit in the economy is shrinking. <laughs> telling one side of the credit story without telling the other does not give us a fair and balanced view of the realities small businesses and individuals know so well. At best, the snapshots might serve the purpose of monitoring at the most general level some impact TARP funds may be having on certain new lending activities, but they don't reflect the net impact of contracting credit activities on existing borrowers. And they tell us nothing about the use of TARP funds, which is the focus of this hearing. Unfortunately, Mr. Kashgari's testimony is not responsive to the purpose of this hearing outlined specifically in, in the letter of invitation sent to him on February 25th. And Mr. Kashgari's silence on the subject of this hearing speaks volumes. The inescapable conclusion is that Treasury is not conducting oversight of the TARP monies dispersed through the Capital Assets Purchase Program to prevent wasteful or abusive use of hundreds of billions of dollars in taxpayers' funds. Perks for company management were considered 
sound business judgment before the financial crisis and taxpayer bailout, and they're considered sound business judgment now using taxpayers' money. Loans to foreign governmental authorities were considered sound business judgment before the crisis and bailout, and they're supposedly sound business judgment now using taxpayers' money. Investments in foreign company operations, even if it results in more layoffs in the United States, were sound business judgments before, and they're sound business judgments now using taxpayers' money. In its current form, the Capital Purchase Program of TARP leaves recipient companies free to use federal funds as they would any other source of income before the crisis and before taxpayers provided the bailout. Treasury's development of the TARP program generally and the Capital Purchase Program specifically has introduced no new transparency or accountability that did not exist before taxpayers were given the bill for cleaning up the mess. It has perpetuated business as usual. It defers to the so-called sound business judgment, judgment of the same corporate management in many cases that led to the crisis we're embroiled in now. TARP was developed under the previous Secretary of the Treasury. Nearly every observation that will be made today originates on his watch. But if the new administration is to avoid perpetuating the approach of the past, real change is going to have to be necessary. It should start with the collection of detailed information about how TARP recipients are using taxpayer funds and the imposition of conditions and standards for how they may use the monies taxpayers have provided and may be called upon to provide in the future. Uh, my colleagues on this committee, with news reports projecting that at least another $2 trillion Another $2 trillion will be requested of taxpayers. It is my hope that this hearing today will help propel the new Department of Treasury to, do, to reform the intolerable deficiencies of the TARP program, thereby making recipients accountable to the public for the use of taxpayer funds. Finally, we owe it to the American taxpayers to provide a complete, comprehensive accounting of all TARP funds that have already been allocated. And after such a thorough accounting is made available, then let the people decide if their hard-earned tax dollars are being spent wisely and in the best interest of the American economy and the best interest of the United States of America. I yield now to uh, the ranking member, Mr. Jordan of Ohio. I thank the chairman, and I'll be brief. Uh, our, um, our ranking member, Congressman Issa, will provide our opening statement. We were in. I was in the Judiciary Committee yesterday, and I think there were 15 opening statements, so we don't need two from our side. But I did want to say to the, to the Chairman, I look forward to working with you in this committee. Uh, since the first time we met, I think, at an orientation session at the Ohio General Assembly in 1994, I have um, always appreciated the Chairman's passion and intensity that, uh, that he brings to the legislative process. So I do look forward to uh, working with you, this Congress, and, and this committee. And with that, I'll turn over to our, uh, our ranking member. I, I, I thank the gentleman. I just want to say that uh, Mr. Jordan's a uh, champion wrestler, and I look forward to working with you as well. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this uh, extremely important hearing. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Kashkari, welcome. Uh, it's, it's not easy for us to hold a hearing on the, uh, the TARP, the Troubled Asset uh, Relief Program, or as some people think it's called, the Toxic Asset Relief Program, because the TARP suffers from a lack of transparency and accountability. Uh, in our previous hearing, uh, we asked questions such as, how much have you spent? Where, where is the money? What is it worth today? Uh, but as of February 6th, uh, <clears throat> the Treasury Department has uh, verified that $300 billion in taxpayers' funds uh, have been uh, provided to our nation's financial institutions in the form of preferred shares, warrants, loans, and insurances against loss. Now, that figure, of course, is outdated today, and we hope to hear an update. Well, the, uh, Department of Tre <coughs> well, the Treasury Department currently monitors aggregate monthly levels of some banking activities it does not require any recipient of TARP funds to disclose the details of any individual transaction that the recipient would not have entered into but for the TARP money. In other words, we do not know if $300 billion of taxpayers' money has changed the, anyone's behavior. As a result, neither the, Depart the Treasury Department nor Congress nor the general public truly knows the outcome achieved by injecting taxpayers' money. Mr. Chairman, this lack of transparency simply is unacceptable. 
We could certainly make the case that this level of transparency and the need for it may not have been anticipated prior to September of last year. Uh, but a government of the future must be designed for transparency. We must ensure that all of our institutions, whether receiving federal funds or simply operating on an interstate basis, be in fact prepared to provide transparency. That means interoperable systems and databases. Uh, <clears throat> we must understand, however, that true transparency re re requires attention not only to what information is disclosed, but to how the information is disclosed. To il illustrate this principle, consider that we uh, receive a del deluge of information from the SEC in, in the form of 10-Ks and other documents. As a matter of fact, my understanding is that there are about 15 million pages of text. If that is simply text, and in order to figure out the state of the top 200 or so companies in America, you would have to go through 10 or more million pages of documents, then that information, in fact, is not information. It's simply pages of text. Good luck sifting through it. In this day and age, every American uh, understands that if they don't do it themselves, they could download from their bank or other financial institution a monthly statement, receive it online, import it into Quicken, into a spreadsheet, into some other uh, accounting system, home accounting system, so they could quickly look at their financial statements, keep track of them from month to month, and, and do analysis of the trends in their own investments. So knowing that you can do this on a personal basis, one would ask, what can we do on a national basis? The answer is, without the pro a promising technology such as XBRL that can standardize all financial reporting for easy accessibility, we will not be able to do the same on a global basis. More than 40 countries have already adopted this standard, including China. The United States is currently uh, requiring the disclosure of information to the FDIC in XBRL format. However, the SEC has been slow to act, took most of last year to consider it, and only recently has approved a final rule that will mandate XBRL for all public company reporting, <clears throat> uh, with, some re with some companies required to comply starting in June of 2009. Continuing with XBR technology, it is clear to the public that when we talk about lettered technologies and, uh, uh, and call them technologies, that they may ask, is this difficult? I'm going to say here today that although we'll receive extensive information uh, later today, it is not difficult. It is simply the federal government requiring that financial institutions, those providing mortgages into the public market, those operating with the public trust, such as public corporations, and those receiving TARP money, provide information in a way that we do not have to remassage it, that it is transparent to a computer. They still have the right, using this technology, to withhold information or to be assured that the government will keep confidential information confidential. But only with this sort of a common format can we, in fact, begin to separate what is often called toxic assets, which in fact is good assets mixed with bad with no ability to decide which is which. Without it, we're back to where we were before September. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I absolutely look forward to Mr. Kashkari's answers on what he can see today, what he knows today, but more importantly for both the first and second panel, I'm desperate and America is desperate to ensure that we do not come back to a hearing three, four, five months from now and find out that we still don't know where the money went. We still cannot quickly decide what assets are good and what assets are bad. Lastly, Mr. Chairman, I believe that when we look at the problem, and Mr. Kashkari has been looking at this in a, a huge way, America had a, a debt level of about 300 percent of GDP, or about $45 trillion plus or minus of debt. Historically, America ran 100 to 120 percent of debt uh, to GDP, meaning 15, maybe $20 trillion of debt. The unwinding of this debt, even with the trillions of dollars that are either pledged or the hundreds of billions of dollars that have been delivered, still has a long way to go. 
I look forward to hearing from Mr. Kashkari how they plan to find the stabilized level of debt that America should be. I believe that whether it is the international institutions that have gone on business as usual, as the Chairman said, providing dollars to foreign investors or it is our domestic spending, that we have to come to grips with how much of the contraction was appropriate because of an excess, an excess that we all found uh, interesting and valuable but in fact didn't realize that when it unwound was inevitably going to uh, give us uh, huge problems. For example, if in fact our 100, 100 to 120 percent of GDP is not the, the new norm, but rather 200 percent of GDP is a new norm, we still have a 15 trillion or so dollar contraction of debt that will be permanent. I know that is not the subject for today, but it is a subject that I look forward to people at Treasury and others working with economists to discover, because we have to decide what portion of America, America's hard-earned money is going to be put into stimuluses, TARPs and others, and how much, in fact, is going to have to be written off to we can't go back to the roaring 20s and we can't go back to the roaring aughts, if you will. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your indulgence. I look forward to this hearing and yield back. I want to thank uh, Mr. Issa, who is the ranking member of the full committee, uh, for his participation. And I think that all members would agree that uh, Mr. Issa's business acumen uh, brings a real strength to our uh, deliberations, not only today, but uh, uh, always. So thank you, sir. It's my honor now to introduce the chairman of the full committee, who's our, our new chairman, and who's, uh, under whose uh, guidance. We uh, helped to craft uh, today's hearing, and under whose uh, uh, guidance we will go even deeper into the workings of this uh, TARP program, as well as the broad range of government oversight and reform issues facing the United States Congress and America. At this time, it's my honor to introduce the distinguished gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Towns, the chairman of the full committee. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Kucinich, um, the uh, chair of the. Uh Subcommittee and, of course, Ranking Member Jordan, uh, for convening this hearing. Oversight of the Treasury's TARP program is an important topic for this committee. And I am pleased that Mr. Kashkari is here today to update us on the program. It is quite clear to me at this point that Treasury does not have the information or personnel in place to conduct vigorous oversight of the TARP program, and that bothers me. The information we have received about the types of data the government is tracking are far too vague to develop measures of the program's effectiveness. I am afraid we are reaching a point where Treasury just does not know what Wall Street is doing with government funds. In fact, I don't think they even know how much they don't know. In my view, Congress has been ex extraordinarily generous in allowing the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve uh, latitude in dealing with the current financial crisis. However, the Federal Government's unprecedented investment of billions of dollars demands further scrutiny. I am particularly concerned about AIG. To date, the government has invested $160 billion, that's B as in boy in AIG and stated last week that AIG may require further support. It should come as no surprise that Congress has expressed the need to know exactly how this money has been spent, on what basis it has been spent, and exactly who are the beneficiaries of this record federal subsidy. But we cannot take it on blind faith that federal financial support of AIG or other firms is being carried out in a sensible manner. We just can't take that. This hearing should tell us what information Treasury is collecting and what information is being shared with the Congress and what information is completely unknown to anyone responsible to the American taxpayers. I hope we can come out of this hearing with a plan for obtaining the information necessary to make responsible decisions about our economy and the burden 
that the American people are bearing to bail out Wall Street. Let me just say, this is not a one-shot deal. We're not going to go away. We owe it to the taxpayers. Mr. Chairman, on that note, I yield back. I, I thank the uh, Chairman of the full committee, and it's an honor to serve with you. Um, at, at this time, of course, uh, all uh, members of this committee, uh, without objection, are going to have five minutes for an opening statement. Any other member who seeks recognition, Mr. Souter of Indiana, do you uh, desire to have an opening statement? Uh, Mr. Cummings of uh, Maryland. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to thank you, and I want to thank uh, our Chairman of the Full Committee for and uh, ranking for making this hearing happen, hearing take place. Um, you know, I was just sitting here, just thinking about our last hearing, and during that hearing, Mr. Kashkari uh, presented. And there were some issues that we brought up that he um, did not know about. And I realize that there's a lot to get your arms around. I, I understand that. But I want us to, I want us to, the reason why this hearing is so important is that we are in probably one of the worst economic circumstances that we have been in in our lifetimes. And I do believe that President Obama is doing everything in his power, along with Treasury Secretary Geithner, to straighten up this mess. And it is just that. The problem is that uh, unless there is transparency and unless there is accountability, it's going to be impossible to maintain the trust of the public. And we need the public trust. Right now, the people in my district are losing their savings, their homes. And as a matter of fact, I was at a town hall meeting the other day, Mr. Chairman, and a gentleman said to me, he said, you know what, I stopped looking at my statement because I'm afraid to look at it. It'll put me in a bad mood for the next month or so, so I don't even look at it anymore. And so they're, and they're losing their jobs. And at the same time, they turn around and they hear uh, about the AIGs of the world, and they hear about the city groups, the abuses of this money. And you know what they ask themselves, the question? The question they ask is, why is my tax dollar being used in this way? But then the thing I think that really alarms them is when they hear the oversight panel uh, in its recent report uh, write, say, uh, and I quote, the panel still does not know what uh, the banks are doing with the taxpayers' money. It's going to be very difficult for the President and for Secretary Geithner to turn this ship around unless we have a situation where there is that transparency and the accountability. But if you don't know, if you don't know what's going on, that's a real problem. And so we found out just recently that AIG was given retention bonus, bonus, uh, payments. Now, these, these retention payments were supposed to be to retain people, but these were the very people that they were letting go. There's also something else that's happening here, Mr. Chairman, and there is an arrogance uh, on the part of some of these company executives with regard to the American taxpayers' dollars. And, and so I'm hoping that, in, in the words of Mr. Towns, that we'll be able to come up with Chairman Towns the, 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 a plan to address this, but the question also becomes is do we have, does the Treasury Secretary have enough authority to do the things that he needs to do? And I'm hoping that those questions will be answered today. And so I look forward to the testimony of Mr. Kashkari and the other uh, witnesses. And uh, again, I thank you all for uh, calling this hearing. Thank you very much, Mr. Cummings. The Chair recognizes Mr. Fortenberry of Nebraska. Well, just briefly, Mr. Chairman, let me thank you for the opportunity to join you on this subcommittee. I think it is a critical subcommittee for the well-being of um, <clears throat> overview of public policy in this country, but uh, also for, I wanted to commend you for, thank, for picking this particular topic as the um, one that clearly sets a priority for the tenor and the paradigm of this committee. Uh, clearly people want to know uh, where their money is going to, and Mr. Chairman, if I could offer this, I think it is very important to review back when the taxpayers were asked to, to bail out 
uh, financial institutions in the name of uh, resetting the economy, stabilizing the economy. There was a question floating around or the suggestion that these institutions were too big to fail. Uh, I think we should be asking, are they too big to succeed? One of the real problems that we have in this country is financial consolidation, the liberalized credit system that brought about uh, the use of exotic financial instruments, as well as um, what seems to be reckless behavior. So I'm hopeful that uh, this subcommittee and this particular hearing uh, delves deeply into this issue to at least answer one question as to where the, the money is going, and then secondly, if this is an appropriate investment. Uh, I, I want to uh, thank uh, our new committee member, Mr. Uh, Fortenberry of Nebraska, for his presence on the subcommittee and also for his observation. Uh, the question that you pose about uh, whether or not a company is uh, too big to fail and your further question about the issue of consolidation in the economy and its effect on the economy is something that is a proper subject for this uh, domestic policy subcommittee. So with the cooperation of our chairman, Mr. Towns, uh, we would uh, look forward to delving deeply into that issue. Yeah, I appreciate your comments, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Welch uh, of Vermont for uh, his opening <coughs> uh, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there does seem to be clear unanimity here about the absolute uh, requirement that there be full accountability. And I want to focus attention on uh, one specific area. Uh, we've used a lot of money from TARP and other programs for AIG, and there's going to be another $30 billion that already has been authorized with no additional requirement that AIG disclose to us how specifically that money is used. And this new use of uh, TARP funds is a significant departure from previous TARP assistance to AIG, and as long as it continues to be given without requiring AIG to fully disclose how that money is being spent, it's going to thwart our efforts to provide answers to the American taxpayer. AIG has been unwilling so far to provide significant information on what financial institutions, either domestic or foreign, are counterparties, the counterparties to its outstanding credit default swaps. That's why, for example, we still don't know who received much of the money that the Federal Reserve gave to AIG. I think we're all in agreement. The taxpayers are entitled to know how their money is being spent. And what I'd like to know on behalf of the American taxpayer is basically this. One, does Treasury agree that AIG can use this money to fulfill credit default swap obligations with taxpayer money from TARP? Uh, two, if so, does Treasury have a specific plan to track each and every dollar that AIG uses to pay counterparties? And three, what plans does Treasury have to compel AIG to release information to Treasury and the American taxpayer on what counterparties are paid? Keep in mind, AIG is 80 percent taxpayer owned, so in a way, AIG is us. Now, the justification, of course, for giving any aid to AIG uh, is the systemic risk that Treasury and the Fed have concluded exists if we let it go under. It's one thing, however, if that systemic risk and the funds that are transferred are used to protect uh, American, average Americans who have annuities uh, and insurance policies with AIG. It's quite another if that money is being used basically uh, to hedge the bets and reward uh, speculators, investment uh, banks, uh, hedge funds that simply bet wrong on some of these cr credit default swaps. So. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my question really goes to getting specific information on how money is being used to pay counterparties and what counterparties are on the receiving end of this benefit. And I yield back. Uh, I want to thank the gentleman for his opening statement and uh, uh, to compliment it, uh, to introduce into the record uh, an article in yesterday's Washington Post by David M. Smith called Tim Geithner's Black Hole, which uh, discusses directly the point that you raised about uh, AIG and the credit default swaps. So I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, a, a former chair of uh, the Government Oversight Committee, uh, Mr. Burton of Indiana. Thank you for being here, Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this hearing. You look the same uh, in person as you do on TV. 
I'll tell you, uh, Mr. Kashkari, uh, I don't think there's a member of Congress that really knows where all this money's gone. And I think what, that's one of the biggest problems we have is, is we, we go back to our constituents and they say, well, where are you spending all this money? And we can't, uh, we can't give them an answer. And we say, well, you just have to trust Mr. Kashkari and, and uh, the Secretary of the Treasury and, 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 and it'll get done. Today I see here that $8 billion of the loan that was, uh, of, the, of the TARP money that was given to Citigroup went to Dubai, a billion uh, by J.P. Morgan Treasury Services. Uh, it was used in development of cash management and trade finances, finance solutions in India. $7 billion investment by Bank of America and China Construction Bank Corporation. Uh, and, and we need to have a, a complete rundown or as complete as possible so we can explain to our constituents why we're doing this and what the end result's going to be. And we, don't, we can't do that right now. And we're supposed to grant you and, and other members of the administration the funds that are necessary to get this economy moving. And for us to be able to do that, we need to be able to convince our constituents that it's the right thing to do. And we can't do that right now. I mean, the people back home are madder than hell about what's going on, and they need to have the facts, you know. The other thing is, uh, currently, uh, only the largest 20 recipients of TARP CP funds are required to file reports of any type with TARP overseers. The other 297 financial institutions do not. I think that should be much broader. I think that there should be a, a, a report that uh, uh, goes to the TARP overseers, but also to the Congress of the United States. You're going to have a much easier time when you come up here, uh, Mr. Kashkari, if we have the facts so that we can go back home and at least make the case that this government's doing the right thing. Every time I go home, people say, my gosh, you spent $700 billion on TARP. You spent $787 billion on the stimulus package. You spent $408 billion or $10 billion yesterday. I mean, we're talking about trillions of dollars. And then Geithner over Treasury says he's going to have to put 2 or $3 trillion into the financial institutions to get them up and running the way they should. And we all want the economy to flourish. But we have to have the facts. And I really hope you'll take this to heart. I know that you hear all this stuff and you say, oh, my gosh, I wish these guys had never shut up. But if you want to have the American people to be supportive, we have to have the facts. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. I, I want to thank the gentleman from Indiana. And I just want to say in support of your statement, I have here uh, a uh, news release from Citigroup with a headline, City Arranges More Than $8 Billion for Dubai. Uh, they received $25 billion in bailout funds on, I believe it was October 26th, and this news release is dated December 14, 2008. Without objection, this will be submitted to the record. Uh, the chair recognizes, uh, I, I think, is Mr. Kennedy is next. Uh, Mr. Yes. Kennedy from Rhode Island, thank you for being here, and you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And following up uh, the, ch the former chairman from Indiana about uh, Dubai, um, Bank of America sent $7 billion to China, China Construction Bank Corporation after it received funds from U.S. tax dollars, Mr. Chairman. I mean, uh, I think the frustration that we all have here, and I heard it from my constituents last week, was that they're prepared, as one of my constituents said, we're prepared to uh, take our medicine. We want to make sure we take it the same as everybody else. And they don't see themselves as taking their medicine the same as everybody else. They see us aggregating the profits of the very wealthy in this country and socializing the loss of the middle class in this mess that we have here. They see their tax dollars going to pay off those who have savings, those who have dividends, those who've made out the best in the 80s and 90s during this great uh, wealth that has been made and accrued over the last several decades, while they, the people who are the wage earners in this country, the people that don't have savings, the people who are paying payroll taxes, are bailing out the very wealthiest in this country. There's something inherently wrong in this picture. And they are not about to have the wealthiest in this country be the only ones with a voice down here. And what's inherently wrong here is that we're aggregating the profits and socializing the losses, and that we're not making sure 
that the, the medicine is shared equally amongst all the American people in terms of how we're making sure that we're all getting back on track evenly here. And that, I think, Mr. Chairman, is what we need to get about doing so that we're not making sure that uh, just a few of the people, the American people, are the ones who are left paying the bill here and letting all these others get off scot-free. Uh, I want to thank the gentleman from Rhode Island and thank him for uh, being on the subcommittee. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Watson. I want to join with my colleagues in thanking you for holding today's hearing. The Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008 authorized the TARP program for the dispersal of $700 billion of taxpayers' money in two tranches to attempt to restore liquidity and stability to the financial system. To date, the Treasury Department has committed approximately $299.6 billion to the TARP funds to participating financial institutions. With nearly half of the allocated TARP money drawn down and an economy which continues to shed jobs and capital daily, it is crucial that today's hearing gives us an honest perspective on the Treasury Department's efforts to regulate the use of TARP funds and insight into how to guarantee that these funds are effectively spent in a manner that maximizes the eventual over returns to taxpayers while increasing liquidity to our banking system is a key consideration for the Treasury Department in orchestrating and distributing the TARP funds. It is also a legally mandated responsibility of the Treasury Department to maintain internal control of these funds to prevent waste and abuse of the taxpayers' money. The current global economy crisis is a result of a systemic unwillingness on behalf of institutions and individuals at all levels to routinely self-examine their financial practices to verify that they are responsible and sustainable in the long run. Now as we continue to implement an unprecedented reorientation of the relationship between business and government, it is critical that we apply this lesson to the actions of the Treasury Department and to all of the TARP recipient institutions. And Mr. Chairman, I would particularly like to thank each of today's panelists for cooperating with this committee. And I sincerely hope that the testimony we hear today will provide us with a detailed assessment of the ways institutions have utilized their TARP funds and the ability of the Treasury Department to oversee the transactions. When we go home to our districts, as other members have described, we get inundated with telephone calls and personal visits. What is going on? When can I lower my mortgage payment? When can I have the interest lowered? What are you doing? And these angry calls are constant. So I would like to take back information when I go back to the district tomorrow, based on what we hear from the witnesses that will address their concerns. So uh, I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for this very significant hearing today. I yield back. And I, th I thank the gentlelady for her uh, constant participation in, in these subcommittee meetings. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Tierney of Massachusetts. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm prepared to go to the witness when we can. Thank you. Okay. I, I thank the, the gentleman for his uh, presence here. Uh, it, uh, if there's no other member of uh, Congress or of this committee who's uh, ready to proceed, uh, we're going to now move to introducing our first panel. Mr. Neil Kashkari was designated as the Acting Interim Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Financial Stability on October 6, 2008. He was asked by the new administration, the Obama administration, to stay on for the sake of continuity and continues to serve 
in a difficult role during this transition. In this capacity, Mr. Kashkari heads the Office of Financial Stability, which oversees the Troubled Asset Relief Program. He's also the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for International Economics and Development. Mr. Kashkari joined the Treasury Department in July 2006 as Senior Advisor to U.S. Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson, Jr. In that role, he was responsible for developing and executing the Department's response to the housing crisis, including the formation of the Hope Now Alliance, the development of the subprime fast-track loan modification plan, and the Treasury's initiative to kickstart a covered bond market in the United States. Prior to joining the Treasury Department, Mr. Kashkari was a Vice President at Goldman Sachs and Company in San Francisco. Mr. Kashkari, I want to thank you for being uh, before this subcommittee today. I know I speak for all the members in saying that. And uh, we're looking forward to your testimony. As you know, it is the policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. I would ask that you please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that uh, the gentleman answered in the affirmative. I will, uh, we've already, at the beginning of this hearing, I had a unanimous consent for Mr. Kashkari uh, to uh, have uh, 10 minutes if he, if he needs it, up to 10 minutes if you need it, sir, uh, so that uh, you will uh, have sufficient time uh, to make your statement. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Towns, uh, Ranking Member, excuse me, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Jordan, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. As you know, uh, I was appointed by the prior administration, and the Obama administration asked me to remain at Treasury for a brief period to help with the transition. I am honored to provide whatever help I can to the new administration. The American people provided Treasury with broad authorities under the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act to stabilize the financial system, and it is essential we communicate our actions in a clear and transparent manner to maintain their trust. Today, I will briefly review the actions Treasury has taken to stabilize the financial system and describe the steps we are taking to monitor the activities of recipients of government capital. Many years in the making, the credit crisis erupted during the summer of 2007. Last year, the crisis intensified and our major financial institutions came under severe pressure from deteriorating market conditions and the loss of confidence. In a short period of time, several of our largest financial institutions failed. In March, Bear Stearns. In July, IndyMac. In September, we witnessed the conservatorship of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the rescue of AIG, the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, the distressed sale of Wachovia, and the failure of Washington Mutual. Eight major U.S. financial institutions effectively failed in six months, six of them in September alone. This stress was reflected in something called the LIBOR OIS spread. It's a key measure of risk in the financial system. Typically, five to 10 basis points. On September 1, the one month spread was 47 basis points. By the 18th, when Treasury and the Fed went to the Congress, the spread had climbed to 135 basis points. By the time the bill passed, just two weeks later, the spread had nearly doubled again to 263 basis points. Credit markets continued to deteriorate, and the spread, just one week later, spiked to 338 basis points, almost 50 times normal levels. Our nation was faced with the potential imminent collapse of our financial system. So many people ask me, what if the financial system had collapsed? Businesses of all sizes might not have been able to access funds to pay their employees, who then wouldn't have money to pay their bills. Families might not have been able to access their retirement funds. Basic financial services might have been disrupted. The severe economic contraction and large job losses we are now experiencing were triggered by the credit crisis. 
However, had the financial system collapsed, this recession, including terrible job losses and numerous foreclosures, could have been far, far more severe. Now, a program as large and complex as the TARP would normally take many months or even years to establish. But we didn't have months or years. We moved as quickly as possible to implement programs to rapidly stabilize the system and prevent collapse. In the 159 days since Congress passed the law, we have successfully implemented the Capital Purchase Program, having now invested in 489 institutions in 47 states and Puerto Rico, 489 banks in 47 states, with approximately 30 new investments each week. The median investment is $16 million. The vast majority of these institutions are banks in our communities. Treasury also helped the Federal Reserve establish a lending program to reduce borrowing costs for consumers, including auto loans, student loans, credit cards, small business loans, and that will begin funding this month. We are planning to expand this lending initiative to include other asset classes, such as commercial mortgage-backed securities. Under Secretary Geithner's new financial stability plan, Treasury, Treasury also announced a new capital assistance program and launched a multi-part housing program to reduce borrowing costs and to encourage long-term sustainable loan modifications. Finally, we are developing a public-private investment fund to purchase illiquid assets from banks also to support new lending. Now, during this time, Treasury has unfortunately had to step in to stabilize several large institutions whose failures would pose a systemic risk to our financial system and to our economy. We regretted having to take these actions, to put so many taxpayer dollars at risk to support firms that had made bad decisions. But our choice was clear. When the consequences of inaction so severe and the potential cost to the taxpayers of inaction so much greater than the cost of intervention. Today, that LIBOR OIS spread, which had peaked at 338 basis points, has now fallen to 34 basis points. We believe the combined actions of Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC have prevented a financial collapse, but we still have much more work to do to get credit flowing to our communities. Now, in terms of monitoring, in January, Treasury began collecting data from the 20 largest recipients of capital under the CPP, representing almost 90% of the capital deployed under that program. Mr. We Chairman, uh, could I just interrupt just for a second here? Not uh, okay. customary to interrupt a witness, so I'd, unless it's something urgent, I'd prefer that Mr. Kashgari would proceed with his statement. Th thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, we published our first monthly lending survey in February. This survey shows bank by bank, the lending and intermediation activities of institutions by category, such as consumer, commercial, and real estate loans. This survey is published monthly on Treasury's website. Now, in recessions, credit levels typically fall as both borrowers and lenders become more cautious. The first survey shows that lending held up remarkably well despite one of the most severe quarterly economic contractions in recent decades. Without capital from Treasury, those lending levels would likely have been much lower. And we are also developing a narrower survey for smaller institutions that receive government capital to monitor their lending monthly. So we will be surveying all institutions. And the new CAP program that Secretary Geithner has announced will also require institutions to indicate their expected use of funds and to increase and track lending against a baseline so we can monitor that. Now, with investments in almost 500 institutions and hundreds more in the pipeline, we must ensure that our investments are targeted at stabilizing the economy, but we must also take great care not to try to micromanage recipient institutions. However well intended, government officials are not positioned to make better commercial decisions than lenders in our communities. The government must not attempt to force banks to make loans they are not comfortable with, nor should we try to direct the lending from Washington. 
bad lending practices were at the root cause of this crisis, and returning to those practices will not help end the turmoil. The ESA was one of several initiatives taken by the federal government to stabilize the financial system, an absolutely necessary precondition to economic recovery. We believe the combined actions of Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC have helped prevent a financial collapse. Nonetheless, the current crisis took years to build up and will take time to work through, and we still face real economic challenges. There is no single action the federal government can take to end the financial market turmoil and end the economic downturn. But the authorities Congress provided last fall dramatically expanded the tools available to address the needs of our system. Mr. Chairman, I would just add, uh, I know many members of the subcommittee have many questions. I've cleared my day. I'm happy to stay as long as you would like and answer all of your questions in as thorough a manner as possible. Thank you, sir. We all appreciate your presence here, Mr. Kashkari. Thank you for your testimony. We're now going to proceed with questions. Uh, members uh, will have uh, five minutes each for the purpose of asking questions. I'm going to begin, and then I'll go to our uh, ranking member, Mr. Jordan. And I would ask uh, all members to uh, please uh, try to observe the five minutes, because as Mr. Kashkari said, he'll stick around. and so. Uh, we are, are open to having several rounds of questions. Uh, I would like to begin, uh, Mr. Kashkari, with questions about the foreign uses of uh, TARP <coughs> funds. When Congress created the TARP, it was responding to a crisis in this country. U.S. businesses couldn't get a loan. American consumers couldn't get a loan. TARP was supposed to restore liquidity and the functioning of the credit market for them. So how do you justify to the American taxpayers a bank's decision made after receiving tens of billions of dollars in TARP monies to make a $7 billion investment in a Chinese construction company. Uh, Chairman, thank you, sir. Uh, I'll offer two, two comments to answer your question. First, we must remember that many of these financial institutions are global institutions, and they take deposits from savers all around the world, and they make loans all around the world. And while we may isolate and identify one transaction here or one transaction there, it's impossible because money is fungible. And I know you've all heard this comment before to track, did that money come from U.S. deposits? Did that money come from foreign deposits? We also have to be careful that if we set hard rules not letting our largest institutions do business abroad, other countries may say, okay, they're going to reciprocate and not let foreign banks then lend in America. So I understand your concern. I absolutely do, but we also walk a fine line, let the businesses make commercial decisions, support the, support the system as a whole to get lending flowing. Now, uh, isn't it true that this loan was made uh, after Citigroup received TARP funds? Isn't that true? Uh, it, I don't know the details of it, but it appears to be the timing as such. Yes, sir. Excuse me. I, I want to go back to that. I, I want to restate the question. Uh, isn't it true that this decision to make this purchase uh, happened after uh, Bank of America made this purchase of stock? Uh, sir, I, I and, and after they know. received the TARP funds, uh, um, Congressman, I don't know when, Chairman, I don't know when Bank of America made various investment decisions. I do know the dates of the announcements, and it appears the announcement was after uh, the TARP. Investment. Right. Oh, I have here for the record the Bank of America to exercise remainder of China Construction Bank option, and it's uh, November 17th. They received the TARP funds in October. Mr. Kashgari, uh, when it's hard to get a loan in this country, is it Treasury's opinion that a bank that received TARP money is justified to arrange financing for an $8 billion loan to the government of Dubai? Uh, sir, again, May I, may I, I want to provide a thorough answer to you, Mr. Chairman. Our highest priorities are twofold. Number one, stabilizing the financial system. And number two, making sure these banks can pay the taxpayers back. And so we've taken great care to not try to micromanage institutions, to encourage them to use the capital in commercially reasonable ways. We put specific protections in. We prohibited them from buying back stock. We prohibited them from increasing their dividends to create economic incentives for them to want to lend the money 
and earn a return on that but, money. But how does, if you, you know, people back home, as Mr. Cummings always likes to ask, people back home want to know, how does arranging an $8 billion loan to Dubai after someone gets TARP funds, how does that benefit the U.S. taxpayers whose money is being used? How does uh, helping a construction company in China get $7 billion after this Bank of America received TARP money. How does that help the U.S. taxpayers? Could you explain this? Sure. Th uh, thank you, sir. When our global firms do business abroad, and if they can make money and earn money abroad, that makes those institutions stronger. It puts those institutions in a better position to pay back the taxpayers because they're earning money. They're raising deposits around the world. So are these investments better? And is it better? Are you telling the American people that it's better to invest in another country than it is for these banks who have TARP money to invest in our own country? A absolutely not, Mr. Chairman. We absolutely want our banks investing in the U.S., lending in our communities. Did you know they were investing in China and in India and in, in Dubai and God knows where else? Do you know that? Well, I, I know that our large global financial institutions do business around the world. But do you, do you know specifically that companies got TARP funds? There's a credit freeze in this country. They get the TARP funds. And then instead of investing in American businesses, many of whom are starved for investment capital, they then export American taxpayers' dollars that were given under emergency circumstances. Did you know that? Well, again, Mr. Chairman, um, th this comes back to one of, the, one of the hardest problems we've had, honestly, I've had in my seat, is communicating this concept of tracking the dollars and where did taxpayer dollars go versus other dollars they got from deposits abroad, as an example. It's this fungibility question that we keep coming right. back to. And so, Mr. Chairman, it's been very hard for us to say, well, this dollar went for this purpose, the tax dollars went for another purpose. We want our banks to be healthy. We want them to lend in our communities. We want them to use the capital appropriately. We want them to show judgment in light of the economic crisis that we're facing. These are tough, these are tough I issues, think, Mr. I Chairman. thank the gentleman. My time has expired. I'm going to go now to the ranking member, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, you may proceed, Mr. Jordan. And we'll, we'll come back. There'll be another round of I questions. I appreciate that. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kaskar, we appreciate you being here. I want to attempt to, at least in my mind, um, cut to the chase. Uh, at the end of uh, your final sentence in paragraph 6, you say, finally, we are developing a public-private investment fund to purchase illiquid assets from banks to support new lending. I mean, that, in fact, uh, wouldn't you agree, but was the, was the whole um, motive for doing the, the bailout in the first place? As I, as I said to a, a group of farmers in my office this morning, I said the $64,000 question, or more appropriately the $700 billion question is, when are we going to be able to go after these assets, these mortgage-backed securities that caused the problem? That's how it was packaged to Congress. That's why members of both parties voted for it and supported the plan. And that was on October 3rd, 2008. To date, am I correct in, in saying that not one mortgage-backed security has been purchased? Uh, yes, sir. And so I, I want you to take as much time as you possibly can to talk about this developing program to do exactly what was supposed to happen five months ago. I think that, in my mind, is the key question, the key focus, and, and, and what has to take place if this is, if this is going to work. So take as much time or much time as I have left on my five minutes and, and walk me through that. Absolutely, sir. Uh, this is a program that Secretary Geithner is very focused on right now. We've got teams at Treasury working with the regulators. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. I apologize. Uh, this is a program Secretary Geithner is working on right now. Uh, we've got teams at Treasury working with the regulators to finalize the program. Uh, it will combine private sector capital with government capital uh, to go after and buy up these assets, sir? If I could just interject here. And we've had uh, Secretary Geithner in front of the Budget Committee, um, and he's talked about, he said basically the same sentences you just said right, right there. Can you, can you give us an idea how quickly that's going to happen? And as the chairman alluded to, I believe in, in his opening comments or someone on the panel did, is it a, is it a staffing concern that is, that is, is, is um, prolonging this decision or, or this, this program getting off the ground. Talk about that as well. Um, I expect, I believe Secretary Geithner has said he expects it to come out very quickly, you know, as early as within a few weeks. Um, again, people are 
doing a lot of work on that right now around the clock. It's not a staffing issue. These are complex issues that involve not just Treasury, not just the Federal Reserve, but the banking regulators. Uh, so there's, there's, these are complex issues that we need to make sure we get right. Sir. Public-private partnership you're talking about. What kind of uh, encouraging statements, comments are you getting? What kind of feedback are you getting from the private sector side? Do they, are they buying this approach that, that you're floating out there and talking about right now? Uh, we believe they are. In fact, we had received inbound unsolicited proposals from people in the private sector saying, we have capital on the sidelines. We want to go after these uh, assets. One of the key challenges right now is there's no financing available for the private sector investors. And so by marrying uh, government capital, taxpayer capital, with private sector capital and providing financing, you can enable those investors to then go after those, uh, those assets at a price that makes sense for the investors and at a price that makes sense for the banks. Because if the, if the private sector capital doesn't have any financing behind it, the returns they need will result in prices that are too low and the banks won't want to sell. So providing the financing is a key component. And it's not it, it's something the Treasury has to do with the regulators. It's complex, but the right people are focused on it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I yield to the, to the gentleman from California. Mr. Kashkari, I wanted to follow up on something that Chairman Kucinich had gotten into. Uh, yesterday, it was widely reported that Citibank had, I understand, two, two months in a row of making positive money. If they ceased uh, overseas loans, uh, my understanding is it's more than half of their total business. What would have happened to those profits? In other words, as much as we here on the day as want American dollars, American taxpayer dollars to go to American investment, if in fact we limited them from continuing their overseas operations, what would be the effects on the profitability of companies like uh, even Bank of America, but certainly Citibank? I, I expect the profits would fall dramatically, and they may in fact then need more taxpayer dollars to support them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I thank the uh, gentleman who will come back uh, on the uh, Republican side to Mr. Issa. Uh, and, and I'm going to ask unanimous consent uh, in connection with your line of questioning to introduce an article from the Washington Post on Friday, March 6th, uh, relating to this uh, public-private partnership, U.S. to invel uh, invite the wealthy to invest in a bailout by David Cho, consumer lending. It discusses this uh, very matter. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. You may proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kashkari, um, I just want to talk about just AIG for a moment. Um, you, you realize they have these, what they call retention payments. Are you familiar with that? Uh, yes, sir. And one of the disturbing things about these retention payments was that they were supposed to, I mean, I kind of I, I understood it at first, that they wanted to retain key people uh, for certain units because it added value to those units and if they were to sell them they would sell for less I mean if those people were to leave but then the financial products division they were given they gave over 400 million dollars worth of bonuses and this is the very uh, unit that uh, everybody admits pretty much caused a lot of the problems for AIG. And then later on, they, they talked about in an SEC filing, recent filing, they say they were giving retention payments for people that were going to be terminated. Now, are you familiar with that? Uh, no, actually, when you mentioned it earlier, that was the first I'd heard that's of that. Just, that's shocking to the conscience, isn't it? It sure is. I mean, see, that's the kind of thing. And when I talked earlier about the public being concerned this is, this is bigger than you. This is bigger than the Treasury. This is, and the reason why I say that is that when people begin to hear these kinds of stories and they hear about retention payments being paid for people who are leaving, for people who bought down the company, they don't, they, what it does is it, it's, and, and they are at the same time they see the moving van coming up to their house, taking their stuff away. And they're afraid, like the man said in my district the other day, to even look at their statement. Or they're getting a pink slip. They don't, they, they, I mean, some kind of way we got to get around that. And then you said something that I hadn't heard before when you talked about how in your statement, you said we should not, you said, 
the government must not attempt to force banks to make loans whose risks they are not comfortable with or attempt to direct lending from Washington. Bad lending practices uh, were the root cause. And I understand all of that. But there's got to be, number one, transparency. And the American people have got to see that they are getting something out of the deal. That's the problem. Da. I mean, they, they, and, and they are upset about that. They don't understand it. And, we, and I know the president is doing a lot of great things, and I believe that we're going, I know we're going to get through this. We have to get through it. But the question then becomes is while the president and, 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 and all of you all are going in one direction trying to uplift the uh, American people and get this economy uh, right, um, is it that, I mean, it's, it's, it's already like going uphill, but I'm wondering if you don't see the problem that the transparency has, what it, the, the, the lack of transparency and accountability, what it does is it puts ice on that hill that you're trying to get up. And what does that mean? It means that it's, it's going to take a longer time, and it's going to mean that a lot of people are not going to have the trust. We need to get out of this mess as fast as we can. And I just don't think a slippery slope helps it. You got me? I do, Congressman. I, I, I couldn't agree more that uh, the communication challenge that we faced has been enormous. And if you look at what the President has done and what Secretary Geithner has done around some of the new programs, they've put in place requirements that the banks specify. Here's exactly how we're going to use the new funds. We're going to track that. We're going to measure and increase our lending relative to a baseline of what it would have been otherwise. And so there will be increased transparency. As the President said uh, before the joint address to Congress, he gets it. The challenge that we all face is uh, how do we get these programs to work, uh, make sure we provide the right transparency, strike the right balance. Then, and this, this is my question. At what point do we say to the banks, we're giving you a billion. Bank, why don't you loan back, you know, a fourth of that or do something, you know, to help. In other words, you, you act like we've got to sit by and say, oh, uh, bank, here's our money. Stay afloat. And while our people can't get the kinds of loans that they want, and I know you're doing some things with regard to loans, but I'm just saying these are the banks that are getting the big bucks. Well, Chairman, I'm glad you raised this. This is a really fundamental point we don't talk about enough, which is the banks are a big part of the story. Banks typically provide 60 percent of credit in our economy. The non-banks, the securitization market, provides the other 40 percent. The banks are lending, not as much as we would all like, but they are lending. The securitization market is gone right now. It's completely frozen. And so we've now launched this new consumer business lending initiative with the Federal Reserve specifically to get loans to people buying cars, small businesses, credit cards, small, et cetera, to get the lending going again. So part of it is the banks, part of it's transparency for the banks, but a big part of it is the non-bank market, and we've now launched a whole separate program to get at that problem. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kashkari, uh, we, there's so many questions, and I appreciate your willingness to stay for a very long day. Uh, first of all, uh, you don't know a lot about me, and you know people come in my office and see a bunch of patents, and, and they think that means technology. Uh, long before I was fortunate enough to be uh, uh, in electronics, I, the Army paid for me to go to uh, DEC school, as it was called back uh, then in, in Massachusetts. And, and I got to see early on how computers were not interoperable, but how they could be, and how when you needed to do big projects, you made them interoperable. When we look at XBRL, you're very familiar with that uh, technology. In a nutshell, if everyone were reporting in a XBRL compliant fashion so that various companies and, that are developing software to read and to analyze were able to see with that common set of, if you were reporting, would your transparency that you don't have enough of today 
be virtually absolute. This is assuming that mortgages were put in that format, that credit cards were in that uh, format, obviously that uh, 10Ks and 10Qs were all in that format, something that's coming. <coughs> Uh, and of course the FDIC, all the material that's already in that format, in addition to the 40 countries or more that are already reporting. If you had all of that today here in Washington, would you have the transparency you need to do your job and do it well? Uh, Congressman, I think it would definitely help to provide common data formats and a seamless way to flow all that data up to one interface that the American people could look at easily. The only caution I'll offer is as a businessman, you know, you are hesitant, business people are hesitant to provide some of their details to their competitors. And so it may still not answer, well, how many individual loans or to who did this individual loan get, but it would certainly help the transparency. Well, uh, assuming for a moment that where information goes is separate from whether or not it's in that format, uh, if everyone that you had uh, or were willing to loan money to or were part of this stabilization were already had the data in that format and could deliver it on your request, would you then have the transparency you want? Uh, again, I believe, I believe it would help. I, I don't know enough about it to know if it would be perfect, but I believe it would help. Okay. Can I have your commitment today? You know the second panel. Uh, which may not get, we may not get to if we keep you all day, uh, includes uh, the president of that organization. We, uh, we, if the gentleman yield, we, we will get to that. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm willing to stay in tonight, too. But the, uh, the second panel includes the president of that nonprofit organization. And, you know, I'm not touting any one format for data, but I am concerned that unless we both go forward with a common interface that you can at least uh, avail yourself of and uh, obviously... Uh, find out, and I think we're going to hear that uh, retrospectively they can in fact analyze many of the things you're not analyzing. If we don't do both of those, you're going to be back here in two or three months uh, not having yet skied, and, uh, and we're going to be asking you some of these same questions about transparency. Yeah, I'd be very happy to look into it, sir. Thank you. Uh, for the record, uh, because I, I, I know it's not a fair question to hit you with today, I would appreciate this committee getting an understanding of where Treasury believes that, if the figure is correct that I've read, that we're at about 300 percent of GDP in debt, historically, long term historically, 100 to 120, where you believe we're going to settle out in sort of the post-euphoria period so that this committee could begin understanding how much contraction you're not trying to fight and how much contraction you are trying to fight in the loan market. Uh, absolutely. I'll, I'll work with our economists to look at that. You're completely correct. Deleveraging is taking place. It's necessary. We don't want it to overcorrect, and we don't want the adjustment to be too rapid or uh, disorderly. Okay. The, uh, I have one tough question, and, and I want to be fair. Uh, I hope we're not blindsiding you, but you're familiar with the Wall Street Journal report of uh, uh, 22nd of January of 2009 uh, that talked about political influence? I am. You are. I'd like to give you a full opportunity to talk in terms of the pressures that you or others have been under, what effect they are having, whether they provide <clears throat> guidance or whether that pressure is undue coming from Congress. Uh, the journal uh, talked both about uh, Ohio uh, potential influence and it talked about New York in, or Massachusetts influence. But I'd like you to talk more broadly, uh, not necessarily just that article. Tell me what it's like when uh, for you with various groups, including perhaps some of us on the dais, c being concerned about our individual banks off of the dais. Um, thank you. Actually, thank you very much for asking me that because that's a very important topic and I appreciate the chance to set the record straight. Um, we have built a very robust process at Treasury for the banks that are applying for TARP funds. They send an application to the regulator, the regulator submits a recommendation to Treasury, we have a formal process of reviewing that, getting more data if we need it, and then making decisions. I have certified part of the, the Obama administration's uh, transparency initiative has begun having the head of the office, so I have, certified to Congress now in January and at the end of February that all of our investment decisions from the beginning, October 3rd, through the current period, have been made purely on the merits of the case, the economic merits, and not due to any undue influence. And I feel completely confident that we have a great track record of that. Now, 
We do get calls from members. We do get calls from governors who are concerned about their districts or their businesses, et cetera. It's important for us to get that feedback of what's happening around the country. Um, most of the time, we just refer uh, people who call to the regulators because the bank regulators regulate these institutions. So I feel very confident in saying there's no undue influence at Treasury. All right, I'm the, I'm the person who signs each of these. Uh, and I'm, I'm positive of that. How, having said that, I'm concerned that these stories have been out there because they serve to undermine confidence. So if, if you'd like to ask further questions about that, I'd love to go into it Perhaps in Perhaps in the second round. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman's time has expired. I uh, appreciate his questioning. Uh, the Chair recognizes Mr. Tierney of Massachusetts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having this hearing uh, as well on that. Uh, Mr. Kashkari, thank you for being with us here today. Uh, may I ask you a question uh, that I think uh, our constituents often raise? We have extensive taxpayer money invested into these banks now. And their feeling is that we're investing in banks that are operated by individuals who were complicit in getting us into this financial situation. Why are we not using the leverage of our investment to change some of the boards of directors and some of the principal offices of these corporations uh, to get them out and get other people in? Uh, thank you. Sir, we, we must segment our broadly available programs. I mentioned we have 489 banks we've invested in. The vast majority of those are healthy banks lending in their communities. There's no reason for us to go in there and try to make any management changes there. We also have these one-off institutions where we've had to intervene to st stabilize them. In the case of AIG, as an example, we fired the management, brought in new management, and we're trying to help them have enough time to pay back the taxpayers. In the case of Citigroup, our recent agreement with Citigroup, they've agreed to change their board of directors so that a majority of the board uh, is made up of independent outside directors. So we hear you, we agree with that perspective, and when we have to take extraordinary action, we are coming in to make sure that these businesses are well managed and that we do not reward failure. Is there an action that the uh, Treasury can take uh, to amend the uh, agreements uh, to define waste, fraud, and abuse, and then to put a provision in there that when uh, we see it, uh, and I assume at some point you're going to send people out to these banks as well as the surveys and things, when we see it, we can take action, whether it's to reverse uh, that expenditure uh, or not. I mean, people look and they hear stories of money being invested in conferences and sporting events and endorsements uh, and things of that nature and perks and bonuses that, uh, to people that ought not to be getting them. Uh, when are we going to have the position as investors here uh, to be able to just uh, take those out, set them aside, and recapture that money if it's, uh, if it's happening? Uh, Congressman, in the new program that the administration has announced, uh, we are going to make sure that boards of directors adopt very clear and published expense policies on things like airplane flights and conferences and perks, et cetera, and then certify that they are meeting their standards. The standards will be public for the world to see and for the world to judge. Uh, and if we can offer our opinion on what those standards look like as well when we see them, number one. Number two, remember, in terms of fraud, there are very strong laws in place for fraud already. And we will go, if anybody tries to defraud, defraud the Treasury or the taxpayer, we are going to bring the full arsenal of tools we have available to us to go after them. And then third, Congress has provided four bodies of oversight for the TARP. Special Inspector General, GAO, Congressional Oversight Panel, Financial Stability Oversight Board. Later this afternoon, you're going to hear from the Special Inspector General, whose very mission is to go after waste, fraud, and abuse. So we're looking at it, and there are independent oversight bodies looking at it as well. I, and I think people do think that some of those conferences, jets, perks, and bonuses get to be waste, fraud, and abuse. And as the definition of them is something, whether you term them in those words or not, uh, that that money can be prohibited from being spent in that way during this interim period, or at least reclaimed if it was. It would be very important for people. I think Patrick made some good comments on that about the way people are feeling. Uh, let me ask you this as well. On the asset purchase program that you're planning to do, that Secretary Geithner is planning to do, what will be the taxpayer uh, assurance uh, or protection for their money on this? Will they form a partnership with these hedge funds or other investment groups? Uh, how will they get their money back? What will be their collateral in the interim? Because the general impression of that now is going to be, here are these people, the hedge fund people and people like that, that benefited most from a broken system that people think they're complicit in breaking. And now they're going to be partners using taxpayer money to come in and get a tremendous profit potentially on the other end. Uh, how do we tell people that that's a good concept, if, if you think it is, uh, and tell people why that's being done as opposed to some alternative method, and what's their protection that they'll get their tax money back? Uh, Congressman, the, as I indicated earlier, the details are being finalized now, but one way of doing that, 
so I don't want to commit to this, but one way of doing that is if the taxpayer dollars are side by side, meaning exact economic terms, so with the private sector dollars. So if the private sector wins, the taxpayers win. If the, ta if the taxpayer loses, the private sector loses. By perfectly aligning our interests, we think that may be the best way to protect taxpayers. At the end of the day, there's, a, an, there's an aversion to taking risk right now because the markets are nervous. And so we as the U.S. government, as the taxpayers, have to now step in and be willing to take some risk. They're no less nervous. Uh, I understand. They're more nervous, particularly playing what they think is a cast of characters, if I can use that loosely. It may or may not even be applicable or fair, but they perceive these people as being part of the problem who are now going to benefit. And would you just comment to that in the remaining time? What should you tell people that these are the people we're dealing with now? They profited during the time that this was all being driven into crisis, and they may have been responsible for some of that, and now they're going to be our partners going forward, and they may benefit greatly from that. Uh, uh, the gentleman's time has expired, but Mr. Kashgari, uh, please answer the question. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Uh, thank you, Chairman. We, we do not yet know which investors will come to the partnership, but my expectation is you will see pension plans coming. You will see people's retirement funds through uh, you know, mutual fund type organizations that will be investing. So there may be some well-known investors that people recognize. My assumption is that most of the capital is going to come from the savings of the American people. Okay. I, I, I thank the uh, uh, gentleman, and we're going to get more into that in the next round. Um, Mr. Souter of Indiana, you may proceed with your question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Koshkari. My, my district needs credit. It's the number one manufacturing district in the United States. Elkhart County has the RVs. We're at 18.3 percent unemployment there. LaGrange is at 18, typically uh, 13 to 17 percent throughout my, all my eight counties. Um, I have a couple of, of fundamental uh, questions. It was a tremendous insight, not very understood in uh, Congress that only 60 percent of the credit comes from banks, and you said the securitization group is 40 percent that has zero right now. Uh, that in the banks, do you know how much of that's going to refinancing in the loans as opposed to uh, actual new purchases? Um, <clears throat> Congressman, I don't have that at my fingertips. I believe it's, some of that is included in our survey. I can go back and find those numbers and get them to you. As, as a fundamental question, because Congress and the general public wants more transparency, do you feel your problem is transparency right now? Oh, forgive me, sir. In Which other words, problem? What we're talking about us being able to see and, and transparency as we do oversight, building trust, American people. Do you feel that you don't know what's going on? In other words, do you need more transparency? I don't believe so. I think the challenges that we're facing, you know, this credit crisis has been unpredictable and it's gotten deeper along the way. And so the challenges we have are striking the right balance of taking aggressive action that we know is going to work, but also protecting the taxpayers. You know, it would be easy if we were willing to just throw money out the window and, and not care about protecting the taxpayers. We could probably clean this up, but it would cost the taxpayers a lot of money. And so and, striking and, that balance is and hard. And following up with that, as you've heard several times, we were told from the beginning that we were going to get the toxic mortgages. Yet every person who, who comes in, every angle that comes in, different presidents say they're going to do toxic mortgages, and they didn't. When you got into this, how much of this was actually toxic mortgages as opposed to toxic credit cards, toxic student loans, toxic car loans, yep. and in the troubled asset, if you purchase this, is that really going to fix the problem? So that's a good question. There's no question the start of this was about mortgages, but the crisis in the mortgage market, residential plus commercial mortgages is a $14 trillion market. So the crisis in the mortgage market put a huge burden on the financial system, which made the financial system pull back from all of these other markets. So when we're doing things on student loans or credit cards or auto loans, that's not to try to solve the root cause of the problem. That's frankly dealing with a symptom to help the American people get through this while we stabilize the root cause, the mortgage market, the financial system. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Yes, because it would be much harder to take a L.L. Bean sweater back as an asset that's been securitized through a credit card than a mortgage. And that's why it's important to know what's in what, uh, that many of us believe that, well, <clears throat> I want to ask a question about mark to market, because that's partly under your assumption of that you needed to get into the banking to provide capital when part of, at least in the banking sector, it's not clear in the securitization sector, um, that 
having a declining economy is turning things toxic that weren't toxic. Uh, that uh, And the banks don't know where their bottom is. In, in my area, where the unemployment is accelerating, where among the people who are employed are still the biggest GM pickup plant in the world. Uh, the 50% of the GM suppliers are in my district. So if you're a lender right now, you don't know where the bottom is. You don't know whose house is, is where. And the mark to market has exacerbated that problem. Now, it also started some of our problem by not having real market values, uh, and I understand that. But isn't there some way that in today's accounting era, in computers, that there could be some kind of a blended, because a lot of these assets aren't going to be sold. In Indiana, many people don't move all that much, yet the housing has just gone to nothing. So the bank assets are declining. What's going to happen in agriculture land if we don't support the ethanol uh, as that market changes? And that they can't the assets don't have any value, so they don't know how to make a loan for a pickup or an RV or the various things that we make. And until we get that credit market, they don't even know how to do a credit evaluation on an individual. So why aren't we looking at some of this mark-to-market -to, to stabilize their asset valuation? Because how can they make a loan when they don't know what their assets are? Congressman, this is a very important point. A lot of people have asked us about it. The challenge is, and there's no question, mark-to-market -market is what we call pro-cyclical. So it exaggerates the swings in both directions. The challenge is right now investors don't have confidence in the statements that they're seeing, even with the mark-to-market. -market. And so they're, they're cautious. For us to go in the middle of a crisis and to change the accounting rules, it's not going to increase me, confidence. Let me interrupt you for just a, sure. a second here, because I've run out of time. Mr. Chairman, since I didn't do an opening statement, can I have a, just a follow-up to this? The gentleman's time's expired, but if you uh, have a quick question, you can that, respond. That in, the, in this uh, challenge, that the, it's been clearly documented, even from the transparency that there is, that there's really a small number of counties that got inflated in where these toxic mortgages are. That when you've only had 2% inflation in your assets, the argument that they don't know what the value is is just not there. That's why can't you, the 80-20 rule, uh, 20 does 80 percent of your sales, that's clearly true here in these mortgages. Why Mr. can't that be applied in some way to these assets? It's not like there isn't a historical tracking, this isn't computerized. I, I don't understand uh, why there's lack of confidence in everything all of the United States when in fact it tends to be localized inflated markets. You could respond briefly. Thank you. Uh, there's no question the housing market is very regional. And there are regions where the maximum run up and now the maximum uh, run down. But the crisis is so large and severe, it's affected the confidence of the American people and investors. And so they're all nervous right now. And so, again, it's hard for us and the government to say, you shouldn't be nervous. Go ahead and make that loan. What we need to do is attack the root cause of the problem, get credit flowing until confidence can return, and then the system can start functioning as it should. I thank the uh, gentleman. Uh, Chair recognizes uh, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Watson. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Kaskari, you might have answered this, but I am still confused. And uh, to quote your words again, uh, you are saying to us that we should not be involved in micromanaging um, recipient institutions, you know, where did the money go? And you said, however well intended, government officials are not positioned to make better commercial decisions than lenders in their community. Bad lending practices were at the root of the cause of this crisis. What would be your definitions of waste, fraud, and abuse? You know, how do you determine that there were bad practices? How do we get into this mess? And what are you going to do about it? Would you try to clarify for me what you define as abuse and fraud? Absolutely. Well, f what got us into this mess were banks making loans that to borrowers who could not afford to pay. Also, homeowners have responsibility as well for taking on loans that they couldn't afford to pay. Regulators had a role to play because they're the supervisors of these institutions allowing the banks to make bad loans. And so those are the bad lending practices that I was talking about. And so in, in a time when people are nervous, 
ordering a bank to make a loan that they, that they think is too risky is a dangerous, uh, dangerous place to go. Now, in terms of waste, fraud, and abuse, I think fraud is clear, especially when it relates to either banks lying to borrowers or borrowers lying to banks or banks lying to Treasury and the U.S. government. Again, we're going to come down on them very, very hard. In terms of waste, the administration has put out uh, some specifications around when we have our new capital program up and running, the banks are going to have to define a very clear expense policy on what they think is appropriate and what's not appropriate, and they're going to have to certify that they're meeting that policy, and that policy will be available for the American people to see. All right, Ken, if I write your letter in regards to uh, what I just inquired about, would you respond, and can I put that up on my website? for my constituents to refer to. Absolutely. We're trying to get to the bottom of this and risky business. And I'm going to now uh, give some of my time to my colleague because there was a question that uh, you wanted. Thank you for yielding on that. Uh, just to, to follow up on that, you talked about this is what you're going to do on the next program. What about the money that's already out there? That's a substantial amount of money and how are we going to track that money and stop that practice from either continuing or being started with the funds that are already out there? Well, uh, Congressman, again, we have to, I segment those firms receiving exceptional assistance from the broadly available programs. We, we have, and we can debate this, we have a view that when we're lending to a small community bank, that wasn't part of the problem. Well, let's take them out. Of okay, session. let's take well, them out. Let's talk about the ones that are in the news every day that great at you and me and, and our constituents on that. The large firms have got a big chunk of dough that continue to have a conference in a very fancy place, that continue to uh, fly like they're zillionaires, that continue uh, to uh, sponsor sporting events in these big boxes, the corporate boxes, whatever. What about them? No, absolutely. And we, we've, we've been pretty vocal that we want the institutions to take prudent action and to re reflect on the kind of economic environment we're in and the and the help that they've already received. But other than reflection, is there any enforcement mechanism? Uh, we, that's precatory language. I wish you would do better, uh, and that would be great. We all wish that. Can we enforce them into doing better, or has that train left the station? Well, I think we can. We've, we have, in many cases, for the exceptional cases, we've asked banks to put together expense policies that, we'll, that we are able to review, and that if they want to make any changes to their expense policies, they have to get Treasury's approval. That's all going forward? That's policy. No, that, no, some of that is going back but as well. But are you telling me that we can't do anything about the money that's out the door, that it can't be recaptured, or that people cannot be? Uh, if those are the people that made those decisions and they've got our money, maybe we should have some impact from having that money invested and get rid of them. Right? These aren't the small community bankers. They're sure. not the problem. We're all comfortable with that. But in these fat cats that are running around and still wasting money in that sense and not listening to the precatory language about what we wish they would do, why not use some leverage of us being the investors to just off with those people and in with people that understand the gravity of the situation? Well, I will say that when we have seen things that we thought were over the top and, you know, just really graded on us the way it's grading on you and grading on your constituents, we have let the banks know. And whether we have a legal ability to force them to do something, they generally get the message and say, we got it. Sorry, it's not going to happen again. Now, the, the, the fine line we all have to walk. I mentioned two objectives. There are many objectives, but our two biggest objectives are stabilizing the system and having the taxpayers paid back. And so banks do need to market themselves. They, unfortunately, do need to have sales conferences so people want to come in, learn their products, sell their products. Some of the press stories that have really inflamed people, when we've looked into them, they've been more ordinary core sales conferences that actually didn't cost the banks much money. I'm not defending it. I'm just saying we have to walk a fine line and allow the banks to run their business and compete so that they can pay the really taxpayers back. I disagree with that, sir. I think we're talking about the ones that don't walk, the ones that go over the line. Fair enough. And getting back the money that they wasted on that and leaning on them, uh, legally or not, to say show good faith and to get any future assistance from us, you better find a way to get that money back into the till that the taxpayers have invested in. Time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. I, I thank uh, the gentlelady and the gentleman. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Burton of Indiana. You may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When you first started dispensing the TARP funds, uh, did you have oversight uh, procedures, uh, definitions, and allowable and prohibited uses of TARP funds, and uniform disclosure and reporting standards when you first started dispensing those? <clears throat> or did you just start saying, oh my gosh, 
we got to get money to this bank or this institution because it's about to go under. I mean, I just wonder how prepared you were to start loaning that money or putting that money out there. Um, Congressman, we, as you remember, when we started out with asset purchases, and then it, in the data that I reflected in my testimony, conditions deteriorated very rapidly, much more quickly than we had expected. So we moved as fast as possible to put capital into the system. One, one minor comment there is, remember, we're buying shares in these companies, preferred stock, getting warrants. So it's not literally giving cash. We are getting securities back. And the banks are paying dividends. We've received over $2 billion in dividends in the first quarter. If you bought Citigroup, you, you, so far you've lost a ton. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is, did you have the time or the inclination to put these procedures in place before you started putting that money out there? We did not put specific tracking procedures in place in okay, terms so of- Okay, you, so you, you, were, you were trying to find out as quickly as possible and flying by the seat of your pants, so to speak. Moving as quickly as possible. Yeah. Well, that's an old Hoosierism, <laughs> flying by the seat of your pants. You know, you were hesitant when Mr. Souter asked you the question about uh, uh, did, did you know really what's going on? And uh, my question is, do you have the manpower over there? I've, I've been told that uh, Mr. Geithner, Secretary Treasury Geithner, uh, doesn't have an awful lot of the staff people in place or assistants in place so that he can really start uh, completing his tasks as quickly as possible because he doesn't have adequate staff. Do you have adequate staff and does Mr. Geithner have adequate staff? Uh, and if not, how long is it going to take? Uh, Congressman, uh, I do. The Office of Financial Stability had zero people on October 2nd. We have more than 100 full-time employees and we're growing every day. The staff is fully operational. It was one of our highest priorities to make sure that the program could run well and we'd have a smooth transition. In terms of Secretary Geithner, he has a very strong team of political appointees around him. And the Senate confirmed appointees, the White House is moving as fast as possible and are making real progress from what I understand. Well, it was reported in, I think, the Wall Street Journal that uh, several of those slots that were very important had not been filled. And with the, with the seriousness of the situation, I was wondering if you were up to speed, and you say you are. Uh, I am, especially, I can speak in great de detail to my office, the Office of Financial Stability. We have a wonderful career staff of people who are passionate about these issues and are working around the clock. Okay, I have one last question. Uh, we've dispensed uh, total, I don't know how much of that you've, you've already put into the system, but uh, $700 billion in TARP funds. How much more are you going to need? Uh, Congressman, this I don't... This is very important. I know it is. Because every time we talk to anybody about what's going on, uh, we get kind of a, an amb ambiguous answer. When, when, when Secretary Geithner was testifying on how much in funds he was going to need to prop up the financial institutions. He said, well, one or two trillion, maybe three. I mean, <laughs> you know, we're not talking about dollars here. We're talking about trillions. And so uh, what's the formula for letting us know how much more you're going to need, and can you give us that? We have enough. There, my staff just said that, that we've deployed about $325 billion cash dollars out the door. More than that has been obligated at this point. Is that the second tranche or the first? No, that's within the first tranche still. First tranche. Actual cash dollars that have left Treasury. Again, more than that has been allocated to various programs. We have enough to get Secretary Geithner's new programs up and running and working. And as we get them up and running, we get them working. When the bank's capital, you know, they're under this capital assessment right now where the regulators are analyzing the bank's capital positions under various economic scenarios. That will give us a lot more information about how much more is needed. And as we see our programs get up and running, we're going to learn a lot. So, Congressman, I cannot give you a number today, yeah. nor can I give you a date. But we will come well, let you know. As soon as you could get that, we'd like to have it, number one. But one more question. Do you think if we had across-the-board tax cuts plus capital gains tax cuts, it would assist in stimulating the economy and helping you out? Uh, <laughs> Congressman, I must respectfully defer to my, my colleagues who focus on tax and budget issues. I am solely focus on financial stability, sir. <laughs> okay. uh, the Chair, thanks, Mr. Burton. And I just, uh, Mr. Burton, I just want to uh, let you know that er uh, at, at the beginning of the hearing, uh, we introduced into the record an article from the Washington Post uh, dated Tuesday, March 10th, 2009, by David Schmick that uh, predicts that the uh, bailouts will run another, uh, as much as another $2 trillion. Here's a marked-up copy of it, but, well, and we, could, we can go back to that in the next round. Uh, the chair 
recognize is uh, the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you for being here, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate your holding these hearings. Um, just to follow up with my colleague from Indiana um, about the staffing issues, if I could, <clears throat> could you uh, answer for me um, what the staff is at the Inspector General's office uh, for rooting out uh, fraud and waste at the uh, IG's office or the Treasury's office for this TARP program? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. It, you, uh, you'll hear from Mr. Borofsky. I believe his staff is in the order of 20 people or so right now. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Could you hear me? Mr. Borofsky, uh, the Special Inspector General, you'll hear from him later today who can give you an updated number. My understanding is he has about 20 people in his office right now and is growing uh, quickly as well. If the gentleman will yield briefly, uh, Mr. Borofsky is on a third panel. Okay, so 20 people for, for what, 8,000 banks in this country or how many banks have we have? We've invested in 489 institutions through the capital program. And how many more banks are? T uh, Several hundred, maybe 500 to 1,000 more are in the pipeline. But we're talking about uh, banks also, uh, top um, several banks with assets, 75% of our nation's assets are in the top several banks. And we have 20 people, 20 people doing the audits of those things? Well, again, sir, I'll respectfully defer to Mr. Borofsky. He, I know that he is growing his staff quickly and is <coughs> leveraging the resources okay. of the other law enforcement the, agencies. I think that's where I think where concerns come in, because before we're going to be able to pass another nickel in this uh, Congress, we're going to have to get the due diligence on these things because uh, our constituents are going to demand it. Um, the foreign entities that have received dollars. I mean, I asked my first question, my Bank of America in Rhode Island received $45 billion from the Capital Purchasing Program, first in Salmon and Tarp, and Ken Lewis from CEO of Bank of America said, taxpayers want to see how this money is used to restart the economy. And then they went around and laid off 121 employees at a facility in my district in Rhode Island. And then after they received $7 billion in Tarp funds, they went ahead and loaned it overseas to China. So. Uh, we have questions, and we want to know where are these dollars going. Are they going to foreign entities? Are, are they, what dividends are they paying? And to whom? I mean, are they going to paying little old grandma's annuities? <laughs> are, they, are they going to paying whose bondholders? And what are the salaries that are being paid? I mean, you know, there are a lot of the culture on Wall Street, people have gotten so accustomed to saying they're worth $2 million a year. And I don't know, but they're just, you know, when people are earning on average um, 40 grand a year in my uh, district, and that's, you know, median wage, that's, they just don't get people, you know, in, you know, Wall Street asking for hundreds of thousands of dollars, let alone millions. And, and yet that's the culture in Wall Street, to, to just ask for these uh, sums of money. So I can tell you, we've got to have a, a new kind of um, salary type compensation system. I know some firms have put new executive compensation uh, systems in place, but that's got to be done because, um, and we 